I have really valued and appreciated what Fintan has written on Brexit, both in the, in the Irish Times, The Guardian, and also, of course, the New York Review. Because I think you're doing a really good job at explaining the English to themselves. <laughs> uh, and I think we should ponder a little that we're here in Dublin, we're talking about a passionate nationalism in the capital of a state that's the product of a state-seeking, a quite a potent state-seeking nationalism of the 19th and early 20th century. And we're not talking about Irish nationalism. Finton's key claim is that Brexit, what really explains, what carries explanatory punch, is that this is the product of an English nationalism. A nationalism that didn't have to speak its name. It, it was a dominant nationalism within these islands. And of course, it was layered with other identities, uh, that of empire and Great Britain. And I have absolutely no doubt that the explanatory power of English nationalism carries a hell of a long way in explaining Brexit. And this is something that the English find difficult to understand, because they find it difficult to acknowledge that they carry this nationalism. At a deep, deep level, nationalism is for the Scots and certainly for the pesky Irish, but maybe not for us. And so it, it's the fact that they actually can't articulate that this is a nationalism, in my view, adds to the soreness of the tooth and the fact that it's carried with an app, that it now has an abscess. Uh, and there's no doubt, those who claim, who say that they are more English than British, 79% of them voted leave. Whereas if you said you were more British than English, in fact, 62% voted remain. So the distinguishing factor was whether you thought of yourself as an English man or an English woman. I also, I really enjoyed in the paper the insight on how un-English this is. The fact that it's will of the people, Rousseau, and all of that revolutionary baggage of the traitors, the, the traitors uh, and the enemies of the people. And that's really un-English. But also what's un-English is this heady rush to cast off the disciplines and stricture, strictures of traditional British pragmatism. The, the island or our neighboring state is engaging in a live field experiment in deglobalization and de-Europeanization. And that is an extraordinary thing to do, given the level of connectedness that we have in the world. And I'm very struck by the fact that in the Brexit process, as it unfolds, that identity politics is really trumping considerations of political economy and future prosperity. So what's happened, Adam Smith's nation of shopkeepers? There's near unanimity among professional economists, I would say it's at about 95% or higher, that say Brexit will leave the UK poorer, jobs will go, firms will leave, and tax revenues will decline. And there was absolutely nothing inevitable about Brexit. All of the forces that Finton identified in, in the paper were present in this society. But all of our societies have contradictions, tensions, conflicts. And these rarely break out and become systemic and allow for systemic uh, transformation. There must always be a window of opportunity. And this window was provided by uh, Prime Minister Cameron. And it was always an extraordinary gamble for a British Prime Minister to even think this was a sensible idea. Why? The UK state, since it became a member state in 1973, but even from the time that it, uh, it asked for accession in the early 1960s. It has always struggled with being a member state. The British have asked for and <coughs> sought more opt-outs than any other country apart, perhaps from Denmark, but that's a, I leave that in parentheses. But the instinctive reaction of the British state to more European integration is, yes, you can do it, but we want our opt-out. And in my view, that's because from the beginning, uh, EU membership did not enhance or enrich the state identity. 
of the United Kingdom. In Ireland, we could frame EU membership as modernization and escape from the shadow of the UK. Germany, it was part of the, uh, the raison d'etat. They could, it was fundamental to the rehabilitation, even the foundation of the Federal Republic after the war. For Italy, they could think of their wonderful contribution to our civilization, but also it was a very necessary scaffolding against political instability at home. For the Iberian states, the return to democracy. For the countries of East Central Europe, the return to Europe. Even for Europe's other imperial power, France, the French always saw the EU as l'Europe par la France. In other words, we could recreate France, but on a, bigger, uh, on a bigger scale. In other words, there was a level of comfort because France opted to lead in Europe after the war, rather than uh, rather, uh, uh, the United Kingdom decided to retreat to the island fortress. So all, every other member state, if I'm a, in the Baltics, I understand why I want to be a member state of the EU, because all I have to do is look further east to Putin's Russia. But for the United Kingdom, membership represented throwing in the towel. It was a symbol of weakness. And if the end of the imperial effort and military might was Basra and Helmund, the start was Suez. And the shock of Suez to the British was extraordinary. And so it was where Britain found itself as a post-imperial power rather than that it was something, a project for the future. It was rather the way out of the past. So it didn't embellish or add to the state identity. But much more importantly, the British, we know from public opinion data, really don't like the EU all that much. Any of the indicators of public opinion that are used frequently, like do you think EU membership is a good thing? Has your country benefited from EU membership? The United Kingdom results are always outlying, always, from the beginning. They have never warmed uh, to, this, uh, to this project. And today in Europe, a majority of Europeans feel both national and European. They're comfortable with being Irish and European or German and European. It's over 50% in most of Europe now. In Britain, it never went above a third, ever, in the entire period of uh, heretofore. So had David Cameron asked any of the very knowledgeable academics on public opinion in Europe to give him a 101 class for, a half an, for one hour as to was this a good idea, they would have assured him, Prime Minister Sir Humphrey, if there had been a Sir Humphrey, not a good idea. So, but he called it because he thought he could win it. It was arrogance, um, he was emboldened by the Scottish referendum, the majority that he won, and then, of course, it was an extraordinarily poor political campaign by, uh, by the Remain. But I would say, given the starkness of the referendum uh, question, Remain or Leave, what was even more extraordinary than the referendum itself was what the British state elite did afterwards. For me, that is, it's just extraordinary and inexplicable. How a country wakes up on the 24th of June and is about to embark on this field experiment without doing any due diligence on what this might mean. It really is extraordinary. What would a, sens what would a, a sensible political elite have done on the 24th of June? You buy time. If you have a political shock and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know where it will end, the first thing you do is you buy time. And given that this was a referendum, you, and that's popular democracy, the only legitimate way of buying time is you reinsert representative democracy. So any sane and sensible British Prime Minister would have gone to the House of Commons and the House of Lords and said, we now have this verdict from the electorate, and we now need to understand what that means. Didn't happen. No one 
actually did any framing or reframing of what, uh, of what happened. And I think we need to really think about what the will of the people means in this sense. Leave was 37% of the electorate, and the actual gap was 2.7% of the electorate. This referendum was lost on the basis of the votes of 2.7% of an electorate. Now, it would be very possible to reframe this, to go in a cross-party commission and to look at what the available options were. Because the EU has lots of degrees of membership and association. It, it, it's an inventor of ways of engaging with it. But instead of doing any of this, what did they do? They gave the hard Brexiteers the key ministries, and they created two new departments. Now, any student of public administration will tell you, not a good idea. It was at least a year after the referendum, there were people in Dexu that did not have computers. And this is not, I mean, the level of lack of preparation in the British system is extraordinary. And it, because the Foreign Office was put to one side, number 10 was, was she called, Madame May called the election, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But t to create two ministries, to have to staff them, to get the expertise, and remember, by this stage, the British had no, or I shouldn't say no trade specialists, they had about 30. Not enough if you're going to uh, engage in what they were about to engage in. So for me, it was not just the fact that the referendum was lost. Anyone who knew anything about public opinion in the UK on the EU would have said, this is a referendum that can be lost. For me, what's extraordinary is the elite failure in our neighboring state. The fact that they, they just didn't take seriously what they were about to embark on. And they, it was all going to be all right on the night. She didn't have to issue the Article 50 notification. The EU would have been mad as hell if she didn't. But she didn't have to do it. She could have waited. And uh, Ivan Rogers, who is, was probably the person who knew most and could have helped them most, he went over and back to London every week for months and months and months and explaining to number 10 what they were about to do. And it got to the stage when he was told that he could only bring one piece of bad news a week and not the four or five that were needed. And he resigned. So their top ex expert on EU negotiations could not remain in office because he couldn't deal with the system. They just weren't listening. And then, uh, so elementary mistake. You start negotiations when you don't know what your goals are, you're not on top of the means, and the ways are controlled by the other side. Because one of the things, the other, I think, that's been, and it's, it's psychological for the British, they didn't really understand what becoming a third country meant. They actually thought this was a continuation of opt-outs by other means. In other words, the EU has always accommodated us with our opt-outs, and this would be just another version. Fatal mistake. Internal differentiation in the EU. You're the country that can stop others going ahead. External differentiation, when you choose exit over voice, the, the balance of forces and power are completely altered. And therefore, to embark on Article 50, followed by the Lancaster speech, she didn't have to put down these red lines. She did this because the Brexiteers, the hard Brexiteers, were on her case. She didn't have to. And because of those red lines, it has predetermined the future relationship that the United Kingdom can have unless she pedals back. Now, we've had a lot of lines crossed already, and so one could certainly think that those lines will be crossed. Uh, but it's, it's going to be a hell of a battle, uh, and it won't be, um, it, won't be, um, it won't be pleasant. And of course, the volatility in British politics is such that we don't know if the government will survive. But what we can say is that Brexit is overwhelming the British political and administrative system. 
It is creating extraordinary uncertainty for firms, economic actors, individual citizens, and the constituent parts of the United Kingdom. It's a constitutional moment. We, its outcome, its eventual outcome, is unknown and unknowable. But I find it uh, extraordinary, for example, that the DUP A, favoured Brexit, and B, favour a hard Brexit. If they understood the historical dynamics here, they would be welding the UK to the EU because it's their best guarantee that a united Ireland will not be on the political agenda and on the table. But uh, as someone, as <laughs> Seamus Mallon said, Sunningdale for slow learners, where there are a lot of Brexit slow uh, learners around. But enough on the uh, enough on 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 the sore tooth. Now to the leaky umbrella. Uh, there's no doubt that in the post-war period, we could characterize the social contract in Europe as Keynes at home and Smith abroad. In other words, trade liberalization on the one hand, but a strengthening of the welfare state on the other. And this was a virtuous cycle. It was a social contract that was really solid. Uh, and uh, that contract is under extraordinary pressure because of the uh, the hyper-globalization of the last period and market liberalization. <coughs> and that has, in a sense, disturbed the congruence between bounded territory and bonded people, uh, and particularly in terms of social solidarity. European states are facing a far more competitive global economic environment, and of course, the Big Bang enlargement to the East has brought many more poorer countries uh, into the EU. Of course, there are losers from international trade, but there are also winners, and I think the liberalization of global trade has brought millions and millions and millions of people out of poverty. For me, the most dangerous part of this wave of hyper-globalization was what has happened finance. It was the fact that finance became unfettered, searching for the highest return, the lightest regulation, and the lowest taxes. And also, the new big giants, companies in the world, the tech giants, they're both the creators of this globalized world and its beneficiaries. And so the question is, uh, can the EU as a regional polity and as a market catch up with these broad global dynamics? What can he do? What can it do? Finton is very prescriptive on this. He argues that there is no Europe that's not a social Europe, and if the European project is not animated by an urgent imperative of social justice, it will die, and there is no democracy if it's not social democracy. I absolutely fully agree with the conclusion there is no Europe that is not a social Europe. If we look at what characterizes Europe and its member state, what stands out beyond tradition of liberal democracy and its the, the shared heritage is the commitment to welfare, albeit in very many national colors. Welfare systems are more developed in some parts of Europe than in others, but in all states there is a commitment to the social state. And even in poorer Europe that began to build that social state later, the commitment remains strong. The question I have is what's happening social democracy? I know that, Finton, when you use the term social democracy, you're not, you're, you're not talking about social democratic parties, but social democracy uh, as a project. But social democracy, both as a program, uh, it's not had a good time in terms of electoral competition in Europe. The traditional mainstream parties, both of the left and right, have had a hell of a decade. They're challenged both from the radical right and left, but social democratic parties have performed particularly poorly in the recent electoral cycles. And I think we need to try to understand that. Why is it that that appeal, because it's a very powerful appeal, isn't working? Is it that social democratic parties have lost their core and they're no longer making that offer? In other words, that the Labour manifesto was the exception? And I think there is uh, certainly merit in that. But I think there is something else going on. And that, I think for social democracy, although it's underpinned by universal values, it is a very national plant. 
the social contracts were very national. They grew out of the particular cleavages uh, in all of these societies. And I think social democracy has struggled, and though uh, social democratic parties have struggled, to develop programs that combine deep interdependence with social justice. And they need to do a lot of thinking about how, do, because you can't reverse. We're not going, the closed economies, we're not, the Albanian option isn't available anymore. So what are the ways and means for social democratic parties to develop the programs, fund the programs uh, that resonate with electorates again? And I think there's another uh, challenge to uh, the social democratic parties, and that's from the radical right. Because the radical right discovered over the last 10 years that there were votes in the social state. And if you look at Le Pen, she's very committed to the French welfare system. But it is welfare for our people, not everyone our people. So it's a form of welfare chauvinism. And that's where you get immigration uh, cutting across the challenges to social democratic parties. So the challenge is both programmatic in my view, but also where you get the coalitions to build that progressive future. I suspect it's there. And I think interestingly, one of the unintended consequences of Brexit is that Corbyn will be British Prime Minister. I worry a little that by the time he is, that in fact the tax take in the United Kingdom, there could well, the value of the pound will be down. In other words, that he will get power in the worst of times. And therefore, regardless of the program, it will be very difficult. And that's the, real, that's the real danger. But I think Brexit, uh, and certainly the last election, has made, uh, has made him uh, electable. So, the, what can the EU, what's the, that, that big umbrella, what responsibility or what capacity has it uh, to, 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 um, to contribute to the rebuilding of a bigger and more robust umbrella? Well, it can't reproduce at a European level a scaled up version of the European welfare state. That's not available. The public Fund, the, the European budget is about 1% of European GNI. You can't build a European welfare system on 1% of GNI. The EU is much stronger on regulatory politics, laws, laws don't cost, than it is on public power that requires financial resources. But that doesn't mean that Europe can't and shouldn't play a stronger role. So I have a number of areas where I think it already is, but needs to become much more robust. The first is to use its regulatory clout to try to bring the big tech giants, as it's trying, both with Apple and Google, to make sure that they pay tax somewhere. Uh, and I think it's leading, the, it's leading now in attempting to, to bring those big giants back under some kind of control. And that regulatory clout is really strong. European competition law is a very strong instrument. And if you want to trade in Europe, and they all do, then that can be used. Secondly, there's no doubt that the Eurozone is not a stable equilibrium. The uh, acute phase of the crisis is over. But there has to be instruments available at a European level that help buffer individual member states in times of trouble. And had there been some sort of unemployment insurance scheme available uh, as an add-on, not to, sup to supplement what the national did, it would have made a big difference to countries, uh, the troubled program countries in the, last, um, in, 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 the, in the last crisis. I think Macron's election opens up the possibility for Eurozone reform. Uh, and I hope that he uses his political and diplomatic capital wisely uh, and that he doesn't engage in institutional tinkering. Uh, the, the French have long argued for the importance of gouvernement uh, economique in Europe. French are a European finance minister. 
I'm not that concerned about the institutions. If, if the European Finance Minister has no tools or instruments, then it's purely symbolic. So I hope that when this rendezvous is finally begins to happen, when Germany has a government, uh, that there will be something substantial here. I also think that Europe has a very important role to play in nurturing a European-wide debate on the contours of welfare in the 21st century. Our societies are now more complex, the role of work is changing, we face extraordinary technological shift and change. And so welfare systems will have to be much more nimble than they have been in the past. And we need to think of welfare systems as having two uh, two axes. The first is the payment side, income support. That's very easy. It's very hard to get the resources, but very easy to handle. It's once you have a, a, a payment system. The other is public services. And public services are much more difficult. To have effective, efficient, nimble public serv services that give the services that people need and families need at the times they need them uh, is very difficult to construct and it requires a very high level of skill and capacity in the state system. So state systems are very good at churning out payments, they're less good at the kinds of social interventions that make a difference in early childhood into school, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and there I think there's an important debate to be had. There's also an important debate to be had on the universal basic income, uh, and there are already experiments in Europe, uh, and I think the EU uh, has an important role to play there to, to to help countries think about how you do social investment well. And then finally, uh, taxation. One of the big gaps in the EU as a polity is that um, you don't get representation, real representation, without some form of taxation. And there have been discussions of an element of corporation tax becoming European, or carbon tax, or a financial transaction tax. But I have a feeling that, and we already pay something from that towards the EU, but we don't think we're making a payment to the EU when we buy something. Uh, I favour some sort of element, small, of personal income tax, because I think only when we're paying something do we get the sense of the two sides of citizenship, the, the rights, but then also the contribution. Uh, these are all extremely difficult issues for the EU to handle because they're riven by interstate cleavage, but also then by political cleavage. Uh, but there's no, I think one of the paradoxes again, or one of the unintended consequences of Brexit is it has forced the others, the 27, to try to understand what it means to be a member state and what the EU means for each state in a way that they hadn't been confronted with because the EU was uh, churning along as it always does, meeting after meeting. But there's been the heads of government and their meeting tonight have had to think about what membership means. And I'm told from those who work the system that there's also an element now in, in the discussions across ministers from the different member states. They have a sense of being a collective in a way that they weren't uh, prior to the Brexit saga. And of course, we know from uh, historically from federations that the external federator always works. So again, Brexit, as it unfolds and as it works its way through, uh, will have many uh, consequences for the system and, of course, extraordinary consequences for this state. I'll finish by saying that if I had, um, if one could have asked three years ago, did the Irish state have the capacity to handle Brexit, which is a really tough issue for us. It's, we are much better off if this doesn't happen as a state and a society. But given that it has happened and is likely to end in Brexit, uh, 
uh, has the state shown the capacity to handle it as well as it could? And I think for me, firstly getting Ireland on the, on the agenda, but also in getting other countries to understand what are those issues that surround our relationship with the United Kingdom has been an extraordinary achievement, both of our politicians, but also our civil servants. And again, it reminds us that public power at its best is extraordinarily valuable. Thank you.